crowd. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to get through this in 15 minutes. Let's do this. <laughs> well, uh, I've been a commercial beekeeper for 16 years. Uh, these days I consider myself a recovering commercial beekeeper. I do things quite a bit differently and pretty backwards than most. But I've been treatment free for 14 years. But I prefer this term, treatment free but not stupid. Every apiary in the world is harboring either the coevolution between the bees and the pressures that they're facing, or it is hosting violence and increasing violence in the pests. And whether you're treating your bees, you're not involved in this coevolution of uh, making the mice more benign. But also, if you're not treating your bees and letting those hives crash, that those parasites are jumping through horizontal transmission, and you're increasing the violence that way because this evolution, when uh, the way the bees are, are, are using, uh, letting the mites take over, spreading deformed wing virus mostly to other hives, is actually bringing up the nastiest diseases and jumping from host to host horizontally rather than a vertical evolution. But so that is part of like these three problems. The first problem, the environment. If you have a lot of these crashing hives around you, reinfesting your hives late in the season, you're probably not going to pull off being a treatment-free beekeeper. You might have to monitor your hives. And even if you do treat them and are being reinfested, those treatments might have to reoccur to keep your bees clean and going into their winter. But uh, this is the order that I see the problems. It's kind of a trifocal lens. Environment being most important, the methodology, and then the genetics. Uh, I'll talk mostly about the methodology today, but genetic, genetics, of course, are also very important. Tom Seeley uh, recently was very quick to point out that the genetic traits that make resistant bees are multifaceted. It's both grooming behavior and forms of varroa-sensitive hygiene. Uh, bees that are able to have a, an acute sense of smell find the infested pupa and call them out. And we're all very interested these days in the uncapping and recapping behavior that can save the pupa but expose the, the mites to more oxygen and curtail their uh, reproduction that way. But I'm gonna talk about some of the mechanical things that we can do in just our uh, queen rearing process or splitting process that kind of mimics bee biology. When bees swarm, the old queen leaves, the whole hive is broodless by the time that new queen begins mating, and the bees, all the mites are then phoretic, able to be culled and groomed by the bees. It's, it's almost like the bees know what they're doing. So, <laughs> So, uh, Kirk, I've learned many things from Kirk over the years, and I've gotten great bees from him. One of the things that I learned is to honor the people that you've learned from, your heroes, over the years. So, Kirk, of course, isn't a top bar beekeeper. He would not be caught working at top bar hives. This is him working one of my hives years ago, so it's pretty much a blackmail photo at this point. But I wanted to put Kirk in here because he was literally the only person who said I could do this when I wanted to stop treating for Varroa 14 years ago. And uh, in addition to just the knowledge that he's passed on to so many people and the good genetics that he's uh, getting out there and when, when he uh, produces queens, just the support that he gave me as a young beekeeper was just so valuable. And it's something that I hope to pass on to other people. So thank you, Kirk Webster. But when I was talking with Kirk, I started, I was selling my own nukes and I told him that, uh, Kirk, I feel like I'm selling my children. And he said that he used to feel that way until he started having too many. And so I started having too many bees, but I had few enough for the first couple years that I was able to get through all my hives and break the brood cycle. I was using queen cells that I had grafted or letting the bees raise their own. And I went from 100 hives to 300 hives to 500 hives. And the mite levels were very low just from that natural brood break that I was giving them when I was making the splits. But then once I had 500 hives, I could not keep up with them and get through everything and break the brood cycle and a system that way. So I started using mated queens in my outyards that I had raised from my stock, but still that's when I started seeing a lot of mite pressure in those hives that didn't get the brood break. <laughs> so I changed up my hive design to these little tiny box hives and I was focusing on a couple of mating yards and I made that the real engine that drive the whole operation. Uh, I was letting my queens go three weeks in the mating nukes. That means they had their own capped brood, quite a bit of it. And it was a pretty small mating nuke, so I had to, when I was catching the queens, I also had to cut back. Uh, you take a little bit of brood out of them. So this is my, me and my friend Tuckabee sitting on these wagons going through the sets of uh, mating nukes. I'm more interested in harvesting the brood than I am the mated queens. 
say I go through 300 nukes that week, uh, say it's a theoretical 100% take, I will get 300 mated queens and I'll get 300 little tiny combs of brood. You can imagine the constant equipment crisis <laughs> that I'm in. But I started taking this brood and after a couple of brood breaks, the, the brood is almost virtually mite free from that, that gap in the egg laying, the gap in the mite reproduction cycle. And it's also super well fed. These bees that are, uh, that are forming as pupa right there will be born with a, a lot of atelogenin in their blood, and they'll be able to regurgitate that as nurse bees to the next generation. So I figured that this is the brood that I wanted to go into my cell raiders, these super well-nourished bees that are very clean, and I had a whole bunch of it every week just from my mating nukes. So I started banking this brood for a week and above a queen excluder, so it was totally capped by the time we could go into next week's cell raisers. And after a couple weeks of uh, boosting these cell raisers that I, I made to house my little baby combs of brood, every seven days I would boost this little box with some more capped brood, totally capped, and a new graft. A couple rounds of boosting them, they started to look like this. This is what you want your cell raisers to look like. But I'm using the same box, you know, and so I developed a system that was self-contained. The brood coming from the mating nukes, going to the cell raisers, and cells go back to the mating nukes. So I didn't even need out yards. I didn't have to split any bees out uh, other than the one, the nukes I was doing with. And I got it down to a weekly system to a point where I knew what I was doing every single day of the year. And believe it or not, I, I need structure in my life. <laughs> so, uh, so every Monday we are boosting these cell raisers and putting a new graft in. On Tuesday, we start catching that week's set of mating nukes, and we pull out the extra brood and bank it above a queen excluder. And the brood stays there till for next week's cell raisers. On Wednesday, we finish that catching that set, and on Thursday, those queen cells go in after the mating nukes have sat queenless for one to two days. And so having this structure actually took a lot of stress out of raising queens. That seemed very complicated, eight day, four day systems, but doing this on a weekly schedule, it means every week I get to try again, see how good the mating percentage can be, how big the queens can be. I can tweak certain variables of the system. Say I can change the, uh, the feed on the cell raisers, I can change a, a design of the mating nukes. And it got to the point, well, well, well for one example of like, like one of the experiments I, I, I started trying, since you, each one of these rings, this is an aerial shot of one of my mating yards. Every little circle, or a bunch of stands of mating nukes, there are four mating nukes per stand, and that center stand is the brood bank. And I started keeping each one of these little circles dedicated to a specific family line that I was grafting from. So I was getting brood from that family line, it was going to that family line's brood bank, and then that brood was going to a dedicated cell raiser of that family line. So I was thinking, oh, maybe this would get better cell take, better acceptance of the queen cells in the mating nukes, better care of the virgin queens. I really saw no difference when the weather was good, uh, the takes could be over 90% no matter what you do. But one thing about that system of really separating the different family lines is that I really got to know the families very well, uh, especially uh, the colors of the bees, their behavior, uh, how runny they are on the combs. And one of the real good determining factors from doing this is the health of the cell raisers and the queen cells they raised. So a couple of the cell raisers were culling uh, some of the queen cells before fruition, and those are some of the lines that I terminated and moved on to different families. So I was grafting from six different families, but I had a seventh cell raiser every week, and I would use that for a guest greeter. So it enables a, a lot of fun <laughs> for like once you have like a, you know what you're doing and every day of the year. And since I was that organized at that point, I started inviting people who were interested in queen rearing or wanted to up their queen rearing game to see that four day system of you know grafting Mondays, catching and banking through Tuesdays, finishing catching Wednesdays, Thursday the cells go in. So this is my buddy Aaron from Jennings Apiaries. He came, he had a couple hundred hives and he saw this four day system, his grafting, catching, and seeing how it could work and how one person could you know raise three, 4,000 queens in a year. And at the end of the four-day queen rearing gauntlet, he looked at me and said, this is way too much work. I'm just gonna buy queens from you. <laughs> like, oh, that really wasn't the intention. I'm really hoping more people can like, raise some good survivor stock and, and get more queen breeders out there. And I started thinking, yeah, this is too much work. You know, it's definitely not for everybody the way I do this. So how do we make this simpler? 
You know, a lot of my beekeeping is trying to keep the sense of awe, the sense of wonder and adventure every day because in America, the commercial beekeepers are some of the most miserable people you will meet. <laughs> not, not all of them, but it's a really, really tough livelihood. It's, it, not everyone wants to pick up this mantle. You wake up in the morning, you have to feed your bees, you have to medicate your bees, you have to move your bees thousands of miles in order to make ends meet. There are a lot of alternatives, and it can be fun, and actually profitable. So uh, how do we simplify the whole system? Well, there's a lot more people these days selling queen cells, ripe queen cells that you can actually ship. Uh, these are from my friends, the Mixas, who are in Florida. They ship at day 14, so the cells actually arrive on day 15. That's the day that they start to emerge, all emerge by day 16 after that. So uh, you pick them up in the morning at the UBS, uh, UPS hub, uh, get them right into your mating nukes before they start uh, emerging. But they're in little cell protectors packed with plenty of cover bees and insulation. I see this as a much easier way of exchanging genetics and at a couple dollars a queen cell rather than $35, $40 a mated queen. You can make more, you don't need this whole armada of hundreds of mating nukes out there to just uh, get some cool genetics out there and provide queens. How do we make it even simpler than that? Well, I, I in the past have messed around with two-day queen cells. These are taken out of the cell razor 48 hours after the graft, placed into a split, and the split will actually finish those queen cells for you. As if they had raised their own, you just give them a little bit of a jump, but you're also changing the genetics. So if we're talking about genetic exchange, getting more growth sensitive hygiene or, or the biting behavior out there, it's, uh, this is a cool way that you can ship uh, uh, genetics without even any cover beads. Actually, you want to cool these two-day queen cells down so the metabolism of the larva slows down. You just wrap them in a damp paper towel and you don't even have to write live bees on the envelope. So something that anyone can do if you're if setting up cell razors and grafting, but what's even simpler than this? Well, the bees actually do a pretty darn good job raising their own queens left to their own devices. And in the 15 years that I've been grafting, I've always done a few walk-away splits, you know, giving a split the right resources and just walking away and seeing what happens. So I'm doing a post for Thursday, come and check it out, for certain uh, the quality control trials that I've done to see how can we get a good queen from just a walk-away split. What are the conditions of the split and the assays of a good queen that would result from that? So uh, I find the best ways are actually to let the queens just fight it out, let them raise multiple cells, and these have a conscious quality control, as uh, David Tarpey proved at NC State University, chewing down the inferior weight queens before they emerge. And uh, here we have some of that drama. You can see that little queen right there. Uh, she's emerged from the cell that's in the middle. There she already chewed down the ones on the far right. And today is her birthday, and she's going out there to slaughter her sisters. But, so, where beekeeping is going in the future, we have to make it more fun. We have to make it more enjoyable. And being part of this co-evolution, where bees have evolved to handle so many problems and pests over the millennia, and now just uh, as humans, for production reasons, have kind of stymied that evolution and actually made the pests, the varroa mites, and the associated diseases so much worse in the last few decades. Whereas it is possible by knowing the biology, figuring out what works for you, and you can be part of where bees will be going in a more viable and sustainable beekeeping future. Because uh, the way I see it, we're all different individuals. We're all gonna do things a lot differently. And what kind of bee world are we gonna like, pass on to people? Is it gonna be fun? Is it gonna be interesting? Is it, uh, how difficult is it gonna be? So, us being all different, you know, I don't care. It, it doesn't matter to me if you're treating your bees or not treating your bees. I run anarchy apiaries. Anarchy does not make rules for other beekeepers. We can all still get along. It's fine, but, you know, in talking about difference, you know, we need people trying new things, uh, doing things in different ways, you know, uh, finding really cool boots to go out to your, your new bees. And where is it gonna go? Well, you know, Supporting difference and never suppressing it is going to be key to having a diverse world. And of course, the bees tell us that a diverse world is a healthy world. But just remember, being the kind of beekeeper you want to be, that fear, aggression, prejudice, monoculture, those are the ways of the dark side. So the state of the bee world is changing faster than we will ever know. So be ready, stick with your friends, and swarm the state. <laughs> Take a few questions. Come see me after class. <laughs> yeah.
Have you done any testing for how long the viability of the two cell queens are at room temperature for like? That's something through a, a SARE grant, a Sustainable Ag Research and Education grant that we just got there that we're going to be testing um, uh, conventional cell raising methods to the two day cells finished by the nukes to uh, these little micro walk away splits that I made. Uh, and looking also at the, the labor input. And I figure after two days of in a cell raiser, you can start more cells per cell raiser that way because it's not finishing them. Two days later, you take them out and uh, ship them, put in a whole other batch in the same starter finisher, and uh, you could even provide them to people who don't have bees and just want to eat the royal jelly. You know, pop them in the mouth and a little wax cut. So there's potential there, and we're talking a lot about genetic exchange and making it easier for people that way. But there's work to be done. It's pretty neat that you can just ship them anywhere and, and pop them in a hive, and uh, it is quite viable. So we'll see you get back to me. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, good luck this year. Thank you, everybody.